Hello, folks. Welcome. We'll be getting started in just a minute or so. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to join us. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, whatever it is, wherever you are. Uh, hope it's a good day for you. Thank you for taking the time to join us. My name is Mark Mamagonian. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs for the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. And on behalf of uh, the association, Nasser, uh, and our, the co-sponsor of today's program, the Society for Armenian Studies, I would like to uh, welcome you. And thank you for, for joining us. Um, I would be remiss if I did not uh, mention that both Nasser and the Society for Armenia Studies are, are organizations devoted to the advancement of Armenian studies through, through programs and publications and supporting research. We are also membership based organizations and we depend on the support of our members. So, we greatly encourage all of you. Uh, if you are not already to become members and supporters of both NASA and the Society for Armenian Studies. A um, couple of upcoming NASA events I would like to briefly mention. On Saturday, March the 12th at 12 noon Eastern U.S. time, we will be presenting a program in collaboration with the Matanadaran in, in Yerevan. And the title of the program is An Introduction to the Matanadaran and its Collections and it will be given by Sona Baloyan, who is Senior International Relations Specialist at the Matanadara. And uh, we hope and plan that this will be the first of a series of collaborative programs with that great institution. And uh, we hope you, you will join us and encourage others to do so as well. On Wednesday, March 23rd at 7 p.m., we will have an evening with Pulitzer Prize winning poet Peter Balakian marking the release of his new volume of poems entitled No Sign. And this program is co-sponsored by the Columbia University Armenian Center and Nasser, and I hope you can join us for that as well. There are many other programs in the planning stages that will also be announced soon. But today we have a program to get to, and we're very happy to have with us as our speaker, Dr. Thomas Sinclair. Uh, Dr. Sinclair was a professor of Turkish history in the Department of Turkish and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Cyprus for many years. He is the author of Eastern Turkey, an Architectural and Archaeological Survey, massive four-volume work, and a contributor to the Barrington Atlas of the Greek and Roman World, uh, and much more. And he writes principally on economy and administration in Armenia during the late pre-Ottoman and early Ottoman period. In the lecture today, Dr. Sinclair will look at the most prosperous period of East-West trade through Armenia, the period of the Ilkhans, in the second half of the, um, of the Middle Ages, and within that period at the most important avenue of trade, the Ayas to Tabriz route. Dr. Sinclair. Well, Mark, thank you so much for inviting me, and it's a great pleasure to be able to give the lecture. Um, and I must also thank you personally for helping me <clears throat> so much with the preparation of the visual side of this lecture. Uh, Which I will put up on screen right now, actually. Good. Uh, I, will, I will continue. Now, the subject of my lecture is trade in the Mongol period of Armenian history, which roughly goes from the 1240s to the 1240s. 50s, um, and mostly during the period of the Ilkhan, who, who started rather later. Um, who are the Ilkhans? They are one division, a breakaway division of the 
wider Mongol Empire, which did break up into four separate empires. And um, with eventually a capital at Tabriz. Now, given that the Mongols are complete intruders, um, what happens in Armenia and elsewhere is a complete sort of radical reshuffle of relationships ways of life, political entities, roads, etc. So um, this is one um, stage in the march of Armenian history. How uh, things worked out to start with is that Northwestern Armenia um, and adjacent areas were still under the rule of the Selgic state, the Turkish state based on Konya, that's in Western Asia Minor, um, until the very end of the 13th century. But the Seljuks themselves were vassals of the Ilkhans. Elsewhere, broadly the center and the south of Armenia, um, the Armenians were under direct Mongol rule, or what means for taxation, etc. Now, may I have the next slide? Mark, may I have the next slide, please? Wonderful. Thank you very much. It's up. It's up. Yeah. That's that's good. So, um, to illustrate what happened, we will look at two basic trade routes before the Mongol period, and one of them is this northern route, and um, you can see that it comes from the east through the bridge. And then we get to Erzurum and Sivas, this Karim, Sivas, Sivas. Um, and the outlets there are on the one hand Sinop and on the other um, Antaye. And the other, the other route is um, goods come from Indian China up to Persian Gulf, uh, <coughs> unloaded to Basra. Then come up past Baghdad to Upper Mesopotamia, which on our map is in the form of Mount Green, um, and then the Aleppo, where uh, Western merchants were uh, stationed to receive and buy them and so on. Now, what happened as a result of the Mongols um, invading the area was that the southern of those two years was completely blocked. How? Because first of all, the Mongols drove before them Turkmenes. They themselves raided um, Upper Mesopotamia, Upper Mesopotamia. Um, and after that, you had a sort of studied warfare between Mongols and the Mamluks, who are the empire of in Egypt and Syria, so which is the northern border of the Mamluk Empire. But they had castles, etc., which were right on the so, so to an extent, the man was simply sitting there and, and preventing things from coming through. The result was that trade had to move to a different line altogether. Anything that would have gone by that southern route get rerouted. If I can have the next slide. Thank you. And you can see now that there's no road going through Mosul, et cetera, but there is one starting at Pias and Cilicia and going up to Sabas, uh, following the same, the same route. So it's that which we should study. <coughs> and we, we can say or also that some trade from elsewhere was added to this route, particularly on the papal um, ban on trade with the Mamluks 
after which the Venetians transferred their trade to Ireland, starting with Ayas. Now we know about the line of the Ayas route from a document which is incorporated in a commercial manual compiled in Florence. And the name attached is that of Francesco Regolò, who is a banking study. But we must distinguish between the document itself, which is quite short, and the full manual, which is pretty substantial. The date of the first, I put somewhere in the 1320s, and the arguments are rather solidly hard, but in any case, there's no, there's no reason to think that the date of the document is the same as that of the completion of the whole manual, which I would put at 1340 or very close to that. So the document is simply what we call an itinerary. It's simply a list of toll points and where tolls were extracted um, in geographical order on the route starting at Ayas and ending at Tabriz. And at each point, the tolls to be extracted and paid by the merchant are registered. Well, obviously the document is the aim of its but um, these could not have been the only people on the route. I would suspect that they were in a distinct minority. Most of the merchants traveling up and down would have been local, mainly Armenia. Now, the, the, the difficulty with using this itinerary to establish the exact line of the route is, first of all, that the names are horribly distorted, particularly towards the end to the bridge. That's the first thing. And secondly, uh, it's unlike what we shall hear later in the Roman itineraries, where there is a distance between one station and another. Here we don't have so we don't have any clues from the map itself, or rather from the itinerary itself, where the next station is. All right, so maybe we fly. Let's look at this route. And first of all, at the port of Ayas in the kingdom of Armenian Celestia. And this is a city which is, is simply created by the new trade. I mean, it, it set up the purely commercial reason right at the beginning of the use of the track from Ayas. Um, it had a large harbor. It had a small walled area, um, which really amounts just to a castle. I mean, it, it doesn't, the wall does not protect the whole city for any means. And um, the, the walled area seems to have protected government functions, the functions of the Armenian kingdom. <clears throat> Tom, um, I'm getting some messages that your the audio is difficult to hear. I don't know if it's possible to be a little louder, but there's also right. maybe connection issues. I'm not sure. Well, if it's, if it's a question of volume, I can speak loud. For sure. That would definitely help. Good. Um, will you put up the next slide, please? Yeah. And particularly financial, like the treasury, probably the customs, and so on. But um, the rest of the city is really just a series of um, houses, warehouses, um, um, public. Um, buildings for the communities, like particularly Genoa and Florence and, and Venice, and churches, and so on. But um, it's all it's all civilian. I mean, and it's all left up to the Europeans what they do there. 
now. Um, I will simply do my best. I'm sorry if I'm not completely clear. Now, you can see the first stage of the root goes up to Sivas. This is a more general map. And um, it goes, first of all, up through Cilicia, northerly. The first stop is at a place which is now called Kadiria. It figures it figures um, in the Pegolotti document as Polidara. Um, it was a walled city. It's uh, got a Roman and late Roman history, so, but it's the wall clearly survived. Um, and the the toll in the document is, is phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's sort of three times, four times more than the normal. Because we're leaving the kingdom of Cilicia and we're entering modern world territory. So then the route crosses the Antitaurus range, which you can see there. Um, and what allowed me to fix it was if you see Omana in italics, and uh, the present name of the site, which is Shah, this is Pegalotti's Gandon. Gandon. Um, that allowed me to put the line of the whole route. Um, in general, we, uh, I'm using uh, Roman itineraries to fix Pegalotti, but I'm also using Pegalotti to fix Roman itineraries. Well, I'm sorry about the sound. And uh, it, it's important to see that Pegolotti can help also with the Roman itineraries. Now, if we can go on again, after going through the mountains, you, you get into the more level country and we're again following Roman routes. Now that's just a, a detail. If I could have the next two. And um, it follows Roman roads, paved roads, and it goes past um, several Celtic caravanserais. You can see one is named here, Sultan Khan. And we get to the city of Sibos of the map. And this is a very special case of a building, uh, sorry, of a city particularly affected directly by um, the trade coming through. Uh, there was obviously a large Armenian element, and maybe one Armenian church in the city. There was also the Monastery of the Holy Sign, which goes back to the 11th century. To the south of the city. There was a Genoese coming, which was, is known from the 1270s. And apart from that, there was a tremendous investment in buildings by the Seljuks and Ilkhani personnel. Uh, many madrasas, which are um, colleges, also mosques and caravanserais and so on, and the storm is seen on this occasion by the, by the trade. And of course, it's in a crossroads position. Um, it isn't just our road, which is the one going back and the two from left to right, but also where I marked to Amasia. And um, also, you, you continue down to Kaiseri and then to Nkayu. Now, next one, please. Going east from Sivas, you get to a different crux in the Roman itineraries, which is occasioned really by um, the fact that they're going through a sort of mountain. Can we have the next? 
Escucha. Uh, again, following Roman roads, one of the Roman stations is a gyla or pasture at the top of the climb. And you then go down into a different valley. Right, very good. Um, if you can see the gyla there, where I marked the take of off each. Well, that's all right. Um, and you land in the valley of the, uh, of the Kelkit Chai, Galget, and come to a small city which was called Nicopolis um, in the Roman late period and late Roman period. But uh, Pegalotti has it as Reboco. And the reason is that. Uh, the Armenians must have been calling it springs. And you can see that that relates very closely to the rock and the consonants correspond. And uh, now the name of the village next to the city, but not actually on the site, is called Shirk. So we go, keep, keep this brief, we go east from Nicopolis to the plains, very easy country. The modern road continues to see names like Kuruber and Paul Lugela, pretty much due east. But it, it is very, um, it, it is very difficult country, very savage climate. What our route does is they diverge to go southeast and take this road down to Kemah, which is an easy descent. Kemah is Pegalotti's Mugisar. It's a vast um, fortified site on cliffs above the upper which is the valley we're now in. And the next stage of the journey is to Yerzinga or Erzinjan. It travels along a Roman road, which I believe was built uh, when Rome first acquired Armenia. Uh, the Romans then had to withdraw. And by the time that the Roman itineraries were drawn up, uh, this road was forgotten about for a very good reason that it wasn't on Roman territory. So, but there is definitely the track of a paved road. Now, Erzinjan is the most Armenian of the cities. And it itself, its layout appears to be to derive from uh, a Roman layout, um, probably a grid layout. We hear of many things, markets, um, cathedral, other churches, monasteries. Um, as you know, there are several monasteries also in the south of the city. Uh, a later source, about 50 years later, the Spanish ambassador says this place is full of Armenian merchants. And I think that is the reality, even then in the Mongol period. There was also a Greek element. You know that. So, if you can have the next slide. At Erzinjan, you leave behind um, paved Roman roads. And we follow where we are. We follow um, the valley of the upper Euphrates, east. And uh, going eastwards, it, it, it's a very easy track. Apart from one place, you can see the Gavazeras La Montaña. There it has to cross a pass. And people are taxed at a, a caravanserai near that pass. Then it, it goes back down into the valley of the Upper Euphrates and follows it. If you can see, that's all the Celtic Bridge. 
and then uh, pick it each. And it, it does that because it's again a much easier line. It would be more difficult, steeper to go by a mama. I turned up, they don't do that. So next picture, please. Uh, so we arrive on the plain of Arizona. We have to cross the river by a bridge, which is in the itinerary, and then advance across the plain to Arizona. You'll, you'll give me the picture, please. Next picture. And Erzurum is in the middle of the, the screen. Erzurum is a very strange case because not merely do we have, well, all right, keep it there. Not merely do we have this very strong trade coming to from Ayas, but also when Trebizond gets thrown as an outlet, <clears throat> which is in the late 1260s, then the trade comes through from there. And Azurum is the place where the two routes join. So why do we not have evidence of a really thriving city building, etc.? Well, Marco Polo, to be clear, in the 1270s, um, it was a thriving city, but it's somewhat mysterious why there's so little action of that. I suspect it's because there was fighting over the city. Um, the Ilhan government isn't always to retain control. And uh, Pegavati's text itself suggests that the man that you have to pay your respects to is not an appointee of the Ilhan government. It's, uh, it's somebody else. So from Anzalun, that's right the left hand side of this slide, you go eastwards through plains. And then south, uh, past Agnik, uh, which has a strange name um, in Pegalotti's itinerary, uh, to an upland plain, which I'll deal with just in a moment, kind of the hard job. And the big taking this rather roundabout way is because, Again, it's much easier. It's much easier to get through these sort of upland pastures, etc., rather than going the other way, um, which is the Roman itinerary takes that. But um, particularly at the beginning, you can see it crossing the mountain range. That's a very difficult climb even now. So we, we avoid that by taking uh, this southerly detour. Now. We have here the plain, and uh, Pegalotti calls it the Piana di Argia. And we also have a small town, Argia. So, why two? And my argument is that in the town of Argia, you will stay if you want, particularly if you want to go further south. Um, you will get through to the band region, you will get through to, to the van itself, the Nazca, um, Litvis, etc. So there you can easily be taxed, or if you wish to stay anyway. The Piana di Angelo, you're going to pay a different tax, but you're paying it to a sort of roving officer, which up with you wherever you are. But there's no fixed point at which the uh, tax extracted. So now we, we continue through quite high country and then come back by a long detour to um, the line of the Roman itinerary. And, and again, we emerge onto a large plain, uh, which was and the uh, settlement of the center of that plain uh, used to be called Kartilisa. Um, it was a Barasha, Barasha get. And um, so at the, I'm sorry, Barasha get is what is marked here as Alash get. 
but um, this is the market of, um, of what Russia gets. So we continue then eastward through plains, and if we can come to the next slide, and we get to <clears throat> the plain beneath Mount Ararat, which in Pekalotti's document is called the Soto Larkanoi. So you can see that this is underneath Mount Ararat. But again, it's not a place. It's not a separate So the, the route then progresses through a series of plains. And it's, it's all very easy. Uh, it takes you to Hoi, which is down there at the bottom right-hand corner. And then you have another stage, and then you get to Tabriz, again, very easy country. Now, the city of Tabriz, um, again, witnesses a sort of extraordinary expansion in this period. Um, under one of the Ilhan, was famous called Razan around the turn of the 13th and 14th centuries. A new city wall about 12 kilometers in length was built to accommodate the expansion in the city. And um, on the other hand, the previous wall was only three kilometers in extent. In other words, um, the new city wall is simply setting the seal on a tremendous expansion which has taken place in the meantime. There were five main gates uh, and inside each of those was a caravanserai, a shopping complex and a hammam. So you can see the emphasis on commercial activity. There were permanent Genoese and Venetian communities both relatively large, as well as merchants from four other Italian cities. Uh, the Venetians and Genoese had their own buildings, such as a, what is called a Fondaco, or a purely commercial building, and a, a caravan. And there was an Armenian element and elements from other of the East Christian in the storehouse. Now, having got this far, we can, we can stay on the screen. Um, we can draw a couple of conclusions. In one of us, that the, that the precise line of the route is chosen not for its directness, but for its ease. I mean, you can get through easily, you have easy gradients. On the other hand, that often results in a circuitous line. But you can see that in medieval conditions, that um, is what the merchant wanted. The authorities were prepared to provide and to guarantee. On the other hand, of course, it does go, go through the right commercial centers, civil areas, and so on. Secondly, the impact on cities was immense. And I tried to emphasize this, particularly Sivas and Tabriz, as far as we can demonstrate. But also, in a manner of speaking, I asked, because it just springs up like that as soon as the trade gets going. Now, to end, I wanted to deal very briefly with two One is uh, comparisons. First of all, comparison with contemporary routes. So how does the IAS road compare with other east-west lines of the same area? Well, certainly uh, with the Trebizond route, it goes through the Black Sea. And what we know suggests a similar composition of trade with silk and spices, etc., but not such an intensity. Now, if we can go on to the next picture, and from the north coast of the Black Sea, 
you have two big ports, Kappa and Tana, and these are the outlets for a step route uh, which travels north of the Black Sea and then north of the Caspian Sea and it gets you eventually to China. Uh, the trade did sustain, thank you, it did sustain some large cities, particularly if you can see Sarai there, that's the capital of the relevant Mongol state up there. Uh, but it, it took time for the trade to get going on this, I mean, the 1320s when it gets lively. Um, and we have to remember that, particularly Kaffa, I mean, why it's such a, an important place is partly because in the Everglades, going mainly to the Mamba Kingdom in Egypt, um, which were recruited on the step to the north, now a very uh, topical area. But to the north of the Crimea, where you have step where they, they went and, and captured them and brought them and they were sold. And you also have the Red Sea route. Um, you would come from Crete to Alexandria, etc. And that was particularly a spice route. It doesn't seem though to have the same volume. So I conclude that this route from Ayatollah to the bridge that stands out among the others. The other thing is, the, how does our period compare with the previous period and the subsequent in the second part of the Middle Ages? And divisions are a little artificial, but if you take the period from 1100 to the 1250s, then we touch on this ball. We have the northerly route, um, which goes to Aden and Sivas, and then goes to um, goes to Sinop and to Antalya, one of the main roads out. And the, the southerly route goes um, via Upper Mesopotamia from the Persian Gulf and ends at Aleppo. Now, taking the period as a whole, we don't have much mention of actual goods. Um, we can look at coins and we find that um, both routes we have um, a very late development, which is minting in silver. But well, silver is the currency of trade. Um, Mints open in silver progressively starting from westerly destinations and working through the long routes um, because the people are purchasing in silver and it's available, and that silver can be used to purchase the next mint, etc. So gradually it spreads along each route. But this again, I, I mean, it's complete by the late 12th century, but it doesn't suggest that it is volume. So then another, the other picture piece, and this will be the last. Looking at this, the subsequent period, if you remember the step route going from Kaffa and Tana, this does continue. Uh, people used to think that it just stopped around 1360, but it not the case, I mean, the evidence for it is um, more subdued than in the previous period. The Trebizond route um, was eventually superseded by the going to Bursa. If you see Constantinople on the map, then Bursa is on the Sea of Marmara, south of Constantinople. This Eventually, I mean, going from about 1400, there's, there's quite a dynamic trade or overland. Um, the um, Upper Mesopotamia, going from Baghdad to 
muscle, etc. Anyway, Aleppo is is pretty dead. And around fourteen seventy, when Aleppo revives, and um, at that point, uh, the, the whole route gets going again, uh, particularly because it's a it's a the mid century uh, European um, a sort of emergence from the, the depression of the great crash of the 13th century and the Black Death and, and so on. I also wanted to say a little bit about the role of money. And um, we have discussed a bit about. Um, how the silver creeps along two different routes um, in the 12th century. And why does it do that? It does it because you have a trade in that. I mean, a luxury Eastern goods, silks and spices, jewels, et cetera, um, they may be right, but they're also very high value. What Europe is sending in return is heavier things. But also much lower value. I mean, things like trade, uh, sorry, like iron and um, tin, soap, uh, rather sort of mundane items. Um, so there's a trade in balance. In effect, the the balance between the two has to be paid for in silver. I mean, it's an indirect effect, but um, it, it requires that there be a flow of silver to Ayas, for example, or to Ontario, and that silver will travel up the route. Now, looking at our period, our northerly cities remain part of the Seljuk Sultan until the very end of the 13th century. And they share, therefore, with the rest of the Seljuk Sultan. A, a currency where the standards kept up until um, almost the, the end of the century. And some of this must be put down, I think, to again to the influx of silver. Um, they did open mines in their own territory eventually, but I think the European main. And again, um, looking looking at the route as a whole, I asked would be one of the points of entry of this um, European silver. Now, right at the end of the 13th century, the United States takes over those northern cities, Sivas, Yerengar. Um, and it also takes over the, the minting. Um, and, and around the same time, just a little bit later, the Ilkhani currency is completely formed. And partly um, the encouragement of trade is its purpose. And the object is to have a standard currency uh, throughout the Ilkhani empire, which is not such a thing. However, um, it didn't last for long. For a decade or so, the weight standard was kept. But then, by a series of changes, it starts to fall. And the, the drops are small and start with, but they get more frequent and they get more drastic until by the early 1340s, they're falling at the rate of 16% a year. But if you think of what that means, it's 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 very drastic. It's not what the Ilkhans wanted, but um, it's forced on them because silver supply is uh, drying up. So what I want to emphasize is that this fall in the standard, which is slow at first, but eventually it, it takes place with a sort of terrifying rapidity. 
only mirrors the path of the European economy, which was contracting at the third decade of the 14th century and crashing in the fourth and fifth decades of the I say this simply to illustrate the extent of the influence of European demand on, on the trade. Now, if there's time, I have a few thoughts to conclude. Um, we're trying to construct a world, a late medieval world. You have noticed that I never gave you any photos, any town plans, just maps. And without the maps, you'd never understand the argument. But let's understand that the medieval merchant at this stage did not have a map at his disposal. There simply weren't any maps. And nor did he work on any plans in, in the cities. So it's a, it's a very different mind to say. The nature of money, as you saw, is quite different. Uh, the means of travel are quite different. We, we have to get used to these facts. Uh, on the other hand, some modifications are absolutely relevant. If we want to understand the position of trade, cities, etc., within our region, which is Armenia, we have to look outside it. Um, I think it's fair to say that previous historians have looked east you know, India and China, but they haven't looked west in Europe. But this is, a, I mean, we, we, may, we may want to look at them, that's a central interest, but we have to look outside. And to understand the society, <clears throat> we have to do this kind of exercise. We have to look at roads. We have to look at cities. Uh, what are they like in order to understand the central things, for example, administration, you need cities. So where are the cities? What keeps them alive? What causes them to, to, uh, to decay? What causes them to come up? So um, I think about what I'm doing here is not just a study of trade. It's also a study of society, or rather it's one of the, should we say, it's the, the skeleton. It's the bones of how we can study society in the relevant period. So with that thought, I come to the end of my presentation. Tom, well, thank you. And I, I, uh, to everyone watching, I really I apologize for the fluctuations uh, in, the, in the sound and, and picture, um, which seems to have affected people's ability, and, and I feel very bad about that. Um, sometimes things are not within our full control, and maybe what we can do is at a, at a future date, re reconvene uh, a similar program and, and, uh, and, and have, have Tom speak again um, on, on this or related subject, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure things are a little bit better situated. But I wanted to ask, one question about uh, Pegolotti himself and, and what you can tell us about, about him and uh, the nature of his um, travels and his, and his merchant activity. Well, that is a very relevant question. Um, uh, it's, it's relevant and interesting. He was an official of a bank in Florence, the Bardi. And this was the biggest of the Florentine banks, but um, not necessarily the most efficient, but at any rate, the biggest of the banks. And it, it is an extraordinary institution with uh, branches in places like London, Paris. Um, Pegolotti worked there. The, the earliest recorded um, knowledge of his working on that bank comes in 1910. But he, 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 would, he would have been employed before that, but um, 
in any case, he um, he works there. Now he had two periods in Cyprus. Cyprus, you notice, is right opposite by us. And um, one of these falls, I remember right here in the, in the mid 1320s, and the second one, um, it's sort of a couple of years in the mid 1330s. And um, I think in 1336, he notes that a trade agreement uh, signed between his bank and the Armenian kingdom. And some people say that he, he must have gone to Ayas in order to do that, which I think the matter is open. And I think it doesn't matter very much. Um, I figure him as somebody who was sitting there in Farm Augusta in Cyprus, and that's how he got hold of this itinerary. I mean, some merchant came back, wrote it down, I don't know where he wrote it down, but he a lot of got hold of it. Um, so there's no evidence for him having been in Cilicia, but he may have gone to court. Uh, he returned to Florence and he then took up one or two um, positions in the, in the city administration. In other words, he moves out of the bank and he goes into the city institutions. Uh, one of the reasons for saying that um, the manual was completed in around 1340, one element of this um, of, the, of this whole trading manual can be dated to 1340. My argument is that after 1340, things went so badly for the bank. Uh, that is unlikely he would have wanted to, to work on it further during this period. I mean, it was a case of sort of saving the bank. So um, that, that is his. Um, it is lucky that we know a certain amount about him and that we can, we can be sure uh, that the manual is, is, should we say, compiled under his supervision. I mean, you, you, apart from that, you can't be sure. But I mean, he certainly played a role in the compilation. I would suspect that the scribal work was done by other people. Um, um, well, what better man to play a part in this compilation? Because he knew, he knew such a lot about trade and about banking. Tom, um, I, I, I fear that our connection is, is deteriorating rather than improving. Oh. So I'm going to uh, break it off there uh, with, with apologies again to you and, and to everyone. And But I want to mention to people that Tom has written an outstanding work, work of scholarship here. And, and you know, I would urge you to check it out. You can purchase it from the Nasser Bookstore and other, other fine booksellers. And again, we'll... we'll We'll see if we can maybe uh, re reconvene uh, on, on a different occasion to do this, not exactly again, but something similar, um, and, and see if we can get the technology to be more cooperative on that occasion. And, and you know, we do a lot of these uh, webinars, and usually the technology and the internet cooperate. Occasionally it doesn't, and, and I'm very sorry when that happens because it interferes with people's ability to uh, appreciate the richness uh, of, of the presentation. So, but nonetheless, uh, I thank those of you who have joined us today. And, and above all, I thank Tom and the Society for Armenian Studies as well for, for joining us in, in presenting this program. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk about this subject. Um, and I could talk about, as it were, related subjects. As as opposed to the very same subject. So we will make it happen. We'll and see. We will, thank we you. Will arrange it. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom, and, and thank you, everyone. Stay well, and we'll, we'll see you soon. Bye.